Good morning. It is seven o'clock on the West Coast and 10 o'clock on the East Coast, which is what time we said we would start. So I am going to kick it off. Um, thank you very much to our panelists for being here. Thank you to the 35 and growing attendees. Really excited to be hosting this event. Uh, my name is Michael Bralia. I'm the director of the Future of Property Rights at New America, which is a think tank in DC. Um, future property rights exists to advocate, to educate and advocate for uh, about the technologies we could be using to address property rights. Uh, property rights is a problem, a challenging problem that is only growing right now. There's a, a lot of trends from urbanization to climate change to just the number of people we, we're trying to help. And um, we're, we're not necessarily always using the, the best solutions for that. So pro future property rights is trying to help the community think about technologies that we could use to do that better and faster. So we're particularly excited to be hosting this because um, what we're gonna talk about is the narrative around property rights. And what, we, what we'll hear maybe is that everyone's got a slightly different definition and a slightly different narrative, but I don't wanna get ahead of us. And I'm, and I'm really excited about this because, because technology was used. Um, to my knowledge, this was the first time there was a systematic data-driven analysis of the how media is talking about property rights and the use of, of big data and natural language processing to, to bring us these answers, is something I'm, I'm really, um, really glad this work was done. So let me briefly just mention who our panelists are and then I'm gonna hand it over um, to our presenter to talk about uh, this work and to, to share some slides and tell everybody about um, what's been done. And before I, um, before I do the intros and hand it over, for the attendees, I wanna point out at the bottom of your screen, you can type in any of your questions and then we will get to those questions at the end. So, so please enter your questions um, at the bottom of the screen via the Q&A. Um, our presenter is Emily Keene. She's the Director of Customer Solutions at Protagonist, which is the firm that did this work. Um, I'm gonna let each of the panelists introduce themselves just so we don't spend too much time on that. And then we have an amazing um, panel Yulia Panfil is in the Property Rights Investments Group at the Midyar Network. Uh, I've had the pleasure of working with her for a couple of years now, and she always has great insights. Uh, Caitlin Myers is a Vice President at Fleischmann Hillard. And then Maitri Morarji is a Senior Program Officer at the Wellspring Philanthropic Fund. And so they will offer comment after Emily presents the incredible work that they've done at Protagonist. And then um, those who are still joining, Please enter your questions at the bottom of your screen via Q and A, and we will take them. Thank you very much. And over to you, Emily. Great, thanks, Mike. Um, I'm going to share my screen, so bear with me here for a second. And hopefully, this will work. So just let me know if you can see my presentation. I'm getting some head nods from the panelists, so um, I think we're good. Okay, well, um, good morning, everyone. Again, my name is Emily Kane. Um, I work with Protagonist, and I'm a director of customer solutions. And um, we have been working with the Omidyar Network on a number of different projects for a number of years um, and started our work around the property rights narrative, uh, I believe, in 2015. Um, so I'm really excited to share that work with all of you this morning. Um, but first, I do want to just give a really quick background on um, how we think about narratives at Protagonist um, and how we define and evaluate them as well. Um, so we, um, we think narratives are persistent stories that hold power. Um, we live in a world that's constantly in flux and there's a torrent of information available to us. So narratives are the um, structured stories that people use to articulate their beliefs um, in order to make sense of the world. And they act as these mental models that allow us to make shortcuts, enable decisions um, uh, from everything from uh, what products we buy, who we vote for, and causes that we believe in. So narratives are really critical for building a movement around a topic, and strong narratives can bring um, an issue to life, leading to social change and new laws and policies. Um, so we see this right now actually around uh, the discussion around climate change and even women's rights in the face of sexual assault, just to name a few. So understanding how to discern these underlying beliefs or these narratives that drive social movement are really imperative to help uh, shape a discourse. Um, 
So what narrative analytics does is essentially assess narratives in a systemic and data-driven way um, that identifies, analyzes, and tracks narratives that matter to a certain issue and allows um, organizations to better understand the dynamics of a discourse and understand opportunities available to them to shape the conversation. And the way we do this is we look at online media across all different platforms. Um, so traditional news outlets, blogs, forums, social media to capture the narratives that people are expressing. Uh, we surface the corresponding narratives that, that we see and then apply the suite of metrics to the narratives to derive meaning of, of, to what people are saying. Um, so, Going back specifically to property rights, um, we know that right now it doesn't, um, sorry, I'm having a little trouble with my screen here. You can still see I'm on slide four. Yeah, okay. Um, so thinking about property rights and our work with our MIDIAR, with our MIDIAR, um, we know that it doesn't really lack, uh, it doesn't really have a strong narrative that some other social, economic, and environmental topics uh, have, like I mentioned, some of the, the earlier ones. So Omidyar came to us and uh, wanted to know how to change that. So, but in order to make movement on that, uh, first we have to know what the current status is. Um, so we asked the question, where does the property rights narrative stand? Specifically, um, what are people talking about and how does that differ uh, across different geographies? Um, how has that conversation changed over time? And where is this conversation taking place? So we did this analysis in uh, two parts. Um, we first actually started with just observing the English com conversation globally. Um, and then Omidyar came back and said, this is great, um, but how does that compare to the Spanish conversation? And would there be any difference? So that's why you'll see here the time frame of, of the data that we pulled was a little bit different. Um, so we pulled thousands of data points into our technology platform. Um, so 42,000 for the English conversation, 20,000 uh, articles and blogs alone in the Spanish conversation. And, and as Mike said, um, what our technology does is essentially use natural language processing and artificial intelligence to find uh, patterns, claims, trends in the content. And what that does is it allows to actually um, have some of the data fall out because it's not always what we call narrative rich. Um, so we're looking for very authentic opinions, emotional language, rhetorical questions, uh, writing that takes a really strong point of view. So what this does is it allows us to filter out paid content and noisy data, um, take out any surface level mentions or uh, passive mentions of property and land rights. And so we ended up with um, over 30,000 articles and posts in, combined with the English and Spanish conversation. Um, so that's really the, the narrative rich content that gives us a window into how people are talking about property rights. And this next slide, <coughs> excuse me, shows you um, the 10 narratives that we found in the conversation. So this answers the first question I outlined, um, what are people talking about? Um, so since we captured the English conversation first, we actually weren't sure when we pulled the Spanish data if they were going to be different narratives. And what we found is actually it was the same topic, sorry, the same narratives. Um, and the difference was the topics that were contributing to the narratives were different. So if narratives are the structured stories that, that people use to conceptualize and articulate their beliefs, um, topics are, are events that can be used interchangeably and in different narratives to support what we call the call to action. And a call to action helps um, a narrative subscriber coalesce on what the potential change or solution is to have a more favorable outcome. So I wanted to spend a couple of minutes walking you through a very abbreviated version of what these narratives are. Uh, so normally when we do our research, um, we have an entire paragraph from the point of view of the narrative subscriber that talks about um, the background and the call to action. So um, I'll just go over these briefly, which will help sort of set up the rest of the analysis we did um, in, the, in the coming slides. Um, so the first narrative we found was land grabbing, um, and this is all about governments preserving property rights for themselves, the rich, uh, and corporations. And they routinely undermine individuals and farmers' rights by giving land away for industrial use or public projects. Second is property rights are human rights. Um, this idea that property rights must be respected and guaranteed to all individuals. Uh, balancing and individual and community rights. This is the discussion around a flexible system that's needed so governments um, can intervene and establish land policies that advance social and environmental good. Uh, the fourth narrative is importance of women's property rights. And this talks about equal property rights for women and how they are critical to, to promote overall economic growth and empower women. 
Writing Historical Wrongs, this is around racial inequalities and, and the ethnic tensions that pers persist today uh, through unequal access to land and natural resources for local and indigenous people and land. And land reform is essential to create, uh, create fair societies and correct these um, uh, historical, and historical injustices. Cornerstone of growth. Uh, this uh, this is uh, the, the, the idea, idea that property rights are essential for a healthy market economy and indicator of economically free and prosperous uh, societies. So respect for land ownership instills confidence in foreign investors whose business investments uh, stimulate national development. Property rights aren't a silver bullet. Uh, this was actually um, a narrative around how, while property rights are an important step in helping people achieve social and economic justice, um, it's insufficient alone in, in reversing discrimination against marginalized groups. Strong laws, weak enforcement. This is around um, weak institutions and corrupt law enforcement officers essentially render well-intended laws meaningless. Uh, governments must take responsibility for ensuring that property rights are upheld for all. Squatting is a crime. This was a uh, new narrative that we found in our most recent round of research um, that talks about that squatters erect camps on private munis municipal property. Um, when they do that, they violate property rights of the, the property owners and taxpayers, and they're, they're a blight to communities and should be demolished. Um, and the final narrative we found was land seizures for redistribution are harmful. Um, so this is all around how when governments seize land from property owners without a fair process, it threatens economic growth by scaring off foreign investors um, and hurts the people that really need the most help. So um, land distribution, redistribution, inevitably leads to corruption and really rarely helps the supposed beneficiaries. So these were the 10 topics we saw um, and derived out of this, this very large data set. Um, so the next logical question that we always ask ourselves is, so how do you start to even uh, understand when and, and where people are talking about this? Um, so how important is each narrative? Um, so we have a composite metric that we run on the data um, that helps us understand the relative prominence of each narrative within the overall conversation. And this is made up of two parts. So, um, one part, we call it the impact score. So the first part is the volume, and this captures the relative size of the audience for any given narrative. And we calculate this by looking at not only the number of articles published, but also the audience reach of the sources in which they're published. The other component of this metric is engagement. And this is how often each one of those articles posts um, are engaged with online through social media networks, such as uh, by sharing, liking, commenting, uh, retweeting the article or post. So this helps us understand um, when people are talking about these issues, how often are they talking about it, and what's sort of the most dominant. Um, and what, what you can see is that um, the land grabbing narrative really dominates the, the discussion, so close to 50% of the conversation. And this is mainly driven by the highly emotional reaction in the English conversation around the Dakota Access Pipeline controversy, or DAPL, um, which through its targeted social media campaigns, particularly on Facebook and Twitter, um, really helped build this op oppositional support. Uh, conversely, the Spanish conversation, it, it discusses a lot of instances of corporate abuse, but none really gather this emotional response that we saw in the English conversation around DAPL. Um, so this is actually, from, from a narrative perspective, really interesting for us when we saw this graph. Um, it's actually quite, quite rare in the conversations that we've observed to see one narrative take up this much of the conversation. So normally we'll see one or two high impact narratives followed by a long tail, but it's much more um, evenly just, just, just distributed, excuse me. Um, so this is actually a little bit unique to the property rights conversation. And so what that tells us from an issue perspective is that um, this land grabbing narrative really dwarfs the other ones um, and indicates that this is really the only issue that's getting attention within the property, broader property rights conversation. Um, so what this says is, is the conversation perhaps isn't as diverse as it, as it needs to be. Uh, another narrative that I want to point out here is the third narrative at 13%, property rights are not a silver bullet. Um, this is actually sort of the inverse of uh, land grabbing when we're, when we're looking at the, um, the division between Spanish and English conversation. So in English, this, this narrative around property rights aren't a silver bullet is, is very policy driven, very wonky. Um, it, it was very much sort of an insider baseball narrative. 
Uh, in Spanish, however, that we had a totally different topic. Um, the narrative was driven by coverage of collectives of small farmers protesting uh, decreasing costs of agricultural goods and the threat this poses to their livelihoods. And so um, this, these small landowners really occupy a unique role in Latin American history, and this narrative expresses that their property rights are threatened by global forces. Um, and so this dichotomy of Spanish versus English really reflects the, the, um, the importance of understanding what's driving a narrative. So I'll stop there for a second. Um, that is our main sort of workhorse uh, metric that we use to start to understand how do we start to figure out um, uh, what's most important. Um, I want to show a couple other analysis that we did uh, walking away from sort of the, the uh, conversation and looking actually more at where, um, what regions really are, what's coming up by region. And so we did this um, by looking at the most prominent narrative published in each region. And so um, we know from the previous slide that land grabbing dominates from an impact perspective. Uh, so you might expect that to be the most prominent narrative globally. Uh, but as you can see, this is a very colorful map. And so what it indicates is there's really a diverse set of narratives prominent within different parts of the world. Um, and so what this tells us is that where you, where you live dictates the most common narrative that you'll come in contact with. It's really the regional issues that drive content, um, which in turn drive narratives. So as regional events become more influential, the property rights issues are becoming more fragmented. And this could have implications for practitioners, funders, and policymakers, because it speaks to this idea that um, when you're uh, working within a certain region, really obviously uh, locality matters. The next um, analysis that I wanted to show you is this idea of how has the conversation shifted over time. And um, I have a set of two slides here. Uh, first, the Spanish conversation. Um, we we uh, really wanted to see how uh, over about the, the year, year and a half that we observed, what was sort of rising to the top. Um, so what you see here in the, in the Spanish conversation, it was social and policy activists that really pushed narratives forward. The white spike in February um, 2017 is in property rights aren't a silver bullet. And this is this idea that um, the coverage around the small farmers could face the cost of uh, agricultural goods going up and the scarcity of water. And that really sparked a lot of public protest. And so we saw a lot of coverage there. Um, we also saw this call to action a couple months later in um, importance, of, importance of women's property rights uh, in the dark gray in April, and this call to action around including more women activists in the property rights discussion. Um, and then at the end of the time period, you see how new economic policies announced for farmers in Mexico really amplifies this idea and this narrative around cornerstone of growth. So um, stepping back and sort of uh, looking at this as a whole, one really important note here is that while uh, individual narratives spike over time, uh, the overall volume of the conversation is, is pretty stable. That is in stark contrast to the English conversation. Um, what we see here is a, a very uh, volatile um, uh, change in the discussion, and this was around the land grabbing uh, narrative uh, in, when the Dakota Access Pipeline was really sort of heating up and that debate was, was front and center um, in the English conversation. And so um, this is actually, again, a very unique trend analysis uh, in our work. I don't think we've ever really seen a, a, a trend line that so just uh, dramatically spiked in a way that we did with, with this English conversation. So that's very unique to the property rights conversation and potentially could have some implications on how you want to message around these sort of viral events. Um, another analysis we did was where is this conversation taking place? So we looked at all of our sources, <clears throat> excuse me, um, both in English and Spanish and qualitatively assessed the source type based on how many readers a publication has on a monthly basis. Um, and as you can see from this pie chart, the, the so source analysis in both English and Spanish support this earlier regional analysis that local and regional events are really driving the conversations um, as those are the publications that really publish the most content about property rights. Um, international sources uh, are the ones that have over 10 million monthly visitors. 
uh, but are both actually very small. So I think the fourth smallest, uh, sorry, the, the, the fifth smallest for English and fourth smallest for Spanish. Um, so what that tells us is uh, at the global scare, scale and the, the broad international audience, um, this is not sort of top of mind in terms of, of uh, what readers are, are seeing and, and um, ingesting. So our sort of top takeaways uh, from this analysis that we've done, uh, we'll, we'll give you five. I could talk about this all day, but <laughs> we'll still just do five. Um, so across the global English and Spanish conversations, the property rights discourse is largely occurring in traditional news outlets and blogs. Uh, so while social media channels are occasionally used to amplify and share certain narratives, uh, they're not really conducive to in-depth policy discussions, and that's likely due to the, the character limits and other sort of idiosyncrasies of the medium. Um, more often than not, social media reacts to content and themes that are in the headlines of traditional media, rather than really driving the conversation. Um, publications with high readership numbers tell uh, property rights stories, uh, that's actually decreased in the time that we've covered this topic. So um, our original analysis, when we did this uh, in 2015, um, the share of, of uh, high readership publications or sort of international publications um, decreased from 24% to 16%. So what this tells us now is that uh, property rights really aren't reaching a similar audience level across the two time periods. Um, this third insight that we, we've already sort of discussed around uh, local issues are spurring national and regional reporting. Um, prominent international out, uh, outlet coverage really is less than 10% of all sources across the narrative conversation. Um, but the national and regional sources account for almost 50%. Um, the next insight is around the, the power of viral content. Uh, so most narratives, when we looked at their impact scores, uh, had more volume than engagement, meaning there was a lot of stories published, but uh, there wasn't really any that got um, much republishing or social media. Um, so this low engagement may indicate that uh, these narratives are not triggering a highly uh, emotional response or resonant campaigns that inspire uh, widespread public mobilization and action. Um, the one exception to this is the land grabbing narrative. Um, so the strong uh, frustration over perceived corporate misdeeds and the lack of adequate government response really drove high engagement, not only in land grabbing, but also strong laws and weak enforcement. Um, and, but that's mostly due to the Dakota Access Pipeline social media campaign. Um, and one actually um, analysis we did after we presented all this work to uh, Omidyar, um, Yulia actually asked us to take out the Dakota Access Pipeline related content. And what we saw was, you know, what, what would happen to the narrative if we took out that, vi that viral content? Um, it dropped by um, uh, 93%. So this really shows the, the power of when a land rights issue goes viral, um, there's, some, there's really some momentum and ability to capitalize on that. So there's, uh, that's, there's some lessons to be learned there. Um, finally, in the Spanish conversation, globalization, particularly the liberal, liberalization of agricultural and trade policies, significantly drove activity in the Spanish uh, discourse. And that's actually in really stark, discourse, stark contrast to the English discourse. Um, farmers reacting to decreasing prices, um, and that actually became the second most powerful narrative within the Spanish conversation, whereas in the English conversation, uh, property rights as a, silver, as a silver bullet really was the seventh most impactful narrative. So there was definitely a difference we saw there. So um, what these insights tell us is that it's clear that the, the global conversation on property rights um, has room to grow. Um, it needs to move beyond uh, spot issues and, and take these regional issues global. Um, and that will help give it more potential to, to create strong public engagement and momentum as a social issue. Um, so where do we go from here? Well, we've actually developed um, a what we're calling the property rights barometer, um, and that measures the quality of the conversation, how it's changing, and why it's changing. And so we're doing this through three different metrics on an annual basis. Uh, first, we're looking at volume, um, so the size and diversity of the, the content discussing property rights. So um, how much content is, is contributing to the narratives, um, what is the source diversity that we're seeing among the different uh, publications? And uh, where are these publications 
um, publishing. So how many countries are actually participating in the global conversation in property rights? We're also looking at engagement. So traction of the conversation through audience engagement and source quality. So we're looking at how many times um, uh, content is shared and where it's shared and also the the social quality. So uh, the proportion of content that's in these high readership publications. We're also looking at this, I, this metric we're calling centrality. So this is um, the depth of conversation through um, topic relevance and language richness. And what I mean by that is uh, article relevance is really how central property rights is featured in the headline of content and the term frequency of property rights and associated words within the document. So is it uh, front and center within the discussion or is it sort of a side issue or a passive mention? Um, this idea of richness, it's, a, it's an indicator we have that looks if an author is propagating a narrative using persuasive and judgmental language, um, which to us signals that it's very narrative rich, um, rather than stated facts unopposed um, to either side of the debate. So uh, we've, we've actually done this uh, assessment with the 2016 data that we've collected and um, ranked the property rights conversation using these metrics at sort of a medium low quality level. And we're going to do this again in, um, uh, sorry, we did it with the 2017 data. We're gonna do it again with the 2018, 19, and 20 conversation as well. Um, so the reason right now it's medium low is the geography, uh, geographic diversity is, um, it's not bad. There's actually 110 com countries um, represented in the conversation. And, but there's, there's a low proportion of um, highly ranked sources. And uh, we find that authors are not using uh, emotive and persuasive language in a, in a way that's similar or on par with other conversations we've observed like human rights and climate change. Um, so we're really excited to see where this conversation goes. Um, and there's definitely more to come and uh, room for growth. Thank you very much, Emily. Was great. Um, we have had a question in background about the slides. We, the, sh the slides will be available um, after the, the webinar. So if you're having trouble looking, if you're staring at your screen closely, don't worry, you, you will get the slides. Um, and I want to remind the par participants, please ask us your questions on Q&A. We'll get to them after the panel. So with that, should we go over to the panelists to um, comment? Yulia, do you want to kick us off? Sure. Um, hi, everyone, and welcome. We're really excited to be presenting this work. As you can see, it's really fascinating and cutting edge work that puts a little bit of data behind uh, looking at what the media is talking about when they talk about land and property rights, who is talking where, uh, and how those conversations are being driven. So, uh, I can say a word about why Omidyar Network was interested in funding this research. A large focus for us, for the property rights team, is around building a movement and shifting the narrative around land and property rights. Uh, but in order to shift the narrative, we first need to know what the narrative is. So for us, this provides an invaluable baseline. Uh, we can see which areas are underreported, uh, how the different trends are move, moving, and it's quite valuable for some of our grantees as well who are working to move narratives in this space. So uh, as part of our portfolio, we have two independent media grantees, so journalists who are covering property rights. Uh, to them, I think that this sort of content is particularly useful uh, because they can see which areas are underreported, um, and they can also see whether they're having an impact on the narrative. Uh, at the same time, for us and for other experts, for think tanks, for uh, activist organizations, this narrative can alert us to issues that we aren't picking up maybe in our research, but that are important locally, that are being picked up by the local media. Uh, what I'd love to see uh, going forward is a breakdown of these narratives at the country level, so that when we scope for, for example, potential investments or interventions on a country level, uh, we can see what the issues are uh, more locally. Um, Another use that I can see for this sort of work is in helping 
organizations uh, structure any sort of programming that involves media because they can see which sources and which types of, of engagement are having resonance. So for example, we saw from Emily's presentation that regional sources seem to pick up land and property rights stories the most. Uh, if I were an organization uh, working through media to spread awareness of property rights issues, that would be an important input for me. Um, a, a question I have going forward for uh, protagonists is, how does this compare to the distribution of sources in other issues like human rights or climate change? Uh, are those issues getting more pickup in international and national outlets or is the di distribution similar? Uh, just um, one more point that I'll pick up on before passing it along to the next discussant. For me, the discussion of volume versus engagement was particularly interesting because it shows resonance. Uh, it's, the, it's one thing to see how many stories are being printed, but it's another thing to see how much pickup each of those stories is getting and which topics are getting the most pickup. Uh, so it shows which topics are really hitting a nerve with people. For example, you can see the degree of engagement on the land grabbing topic driven by Dapple and Emily uh, gave some background on, on that. Uh, Another example is the human rights angle, which is driving significant engagement, so social media uh, engagement in Spanish, but not in English. And this seems to be driven by the coverage of the death of uh, human rights defenders like Berta Caceres, which ignited a wave of protests. So for me, this is really uh, just the beginning of an exciting uh, on, ongoing kind of longitudinal analysis and can be really informative for researchers, media organizations, uh, activists working in this space. A couple of things that I would love to see more of going forward, I mentioned uh, some national level breakdowns. Uh, also, I'd like to see some comparisons against other development topics. And finally, in terms of languages, we were able to add Spanish language, but I think that uh, looking at these topics also in French uh, would be particularly useful to see how uh, they're breaking down um, around uh, France, some of the Pacific Islands and West Africa. Thank you. Thank you, Yulia. Um, with that, Caitlin, do you wanna share your thoughts? Sure. Um, hi, everybody. I work with Fleischmann Hillard, a communications agency um, that works with Omidyar Network uh, across their various portfolios of investments. Um, and in particular, I work with Yulia and the property rights team. Um, and so when she shared the narrative of analytics report with me, um, it was really exciting to see that this is um, the start of a data driven conversation around what. Uh, what an organization can and should be doing regarding its external communications. Um, for many of you on the webinar um, that are involved with an organization's communications, it can often seem, uh, as you'll probably agree with me, uh, goals and outcomes related to your communications efforts um, can often be hard to put into a larger context, right? Uh, is that blog we wrote or is that op-ed we placed or that panel we participated in? Is that having an impact um, in the grand scheme of things and how do we know? Um, and so what I like about this report in and of itself is that it can help start a data-driven conversation around what's working and what's not regarding how you and your organization are communicating externally. Um, and I think part of that conversation that you can have uh, with those in, within your in your line of work um, is really getting back to kind of the 101 of communications kind of it, it helps you have a moment of self-reflection and think all right what are our goals as an organization who are we trying to reach and what do we need them to think or do because of the work that we're doing and I think looking at a tool like narrative analytics can help uh, start to steer that conversation in the right direction so a lot of the decisions aren't necessarily being based on kind of anecdotal experiences that you and your colleagues might have had um, so as I've looked at this report, um, you know, I think there's two ways that people can kind of start to think about things um, in those moments of self-reflection with your organization. Um, you know, if you do see a narrative um, in this report in that list that Emily shared earlier, if, if one of those narratives does resonate with you and you feel like that's kind of along the lines that your, your organization is communicating, um, I think that that's uh, likely a good sign that you are 
dialing into a larger global narrative. Um, and, and then the question becomes, uh, you know, what are the right tactics to help amplify that even further? And then I think the bigger thing to keep an eye on is if you and your organization are talking about property rights in a way that you do not see reflected in a report like this, um, that's really the moment of bigger self-reflection to say, okay, am, are we and am I um, on track with the goals that I've set for my organization? Am I truly reaching the audiences um, that we know are important to work that we're doing? And, um, and looking at kind of the results that you see in this report can help you start to think, all right, maybe we need to be communicating in a little bit of a different way. Maybe we need to tap into uh, a different one of these narratives to see if it can resonate better with the, organ uh, the audiences that we're working with. Um, and if you are an organization like many that we work with through a media network, an organization that might just be getting its footing, might just be getting off the ground, um, I think a report like Narrative Analytics gives you um, a good starting point to say, okay, how do we want to talk about the work that we're doing? Um, and really trying to tailor it to the markets and the people that you are uh, trying to reach. Um, so I think about, you know, I really like the geography slide that Emily shared earlier um, that breaks it down by geography. Uh, and then I also really, really like the um, breakdown of sources because it really helps in the, in the world of communications where there's so many different things that any one organization um, could be doing. This really helps uh, you put a laser focus on what are the kind of levers or drivers that might make um, the biggest impact um, and provide you guys with the highest ROI for the efforts that you're going to put into your communications. Um, Overall, I think one thing that I'd be interested to hear more from um, Emily and the narrative analytics team is um, just from previous experience, and I think Yuli hit on this a little bit, but from previous experience um, tracking other narratives year over year, I'd love to hear kind of what were the kinds of things that made the biggest difference in changing um, any one narrative's trajectory year over year. So if there were kind of key uh, tactics or drivers, if you will, that um, seem to make a difference. Um, I think that that's an invaluable uh, insight that could be applied to property rights as well. Great, thank you, Caitlin. Yeah, the sources and geography were definitely the two slides that I was, I think, probably closest to the screen. Um, with that, uh, Maitri, if you want to share your thoughts and please just do a quick introduction to begin. Good morning, everyone. My name is Maitri Muraji. I'm a senior program officer at Wellspring Philanthropic Fund, which is a private foundation based in New York, um, where I oversee um, a program specifically focusing on women's land and property rights. So I'll speak from that perspective. Um, thank you very much for sharing these really interesting findings that I think paint a, a picture of what the global discussion on property rights really looks like. Um, I'll reflect for a few minutes on what, what is particularly interesting for me, and then I'll share some lingering questions that come up for me, both in listening to this pres presentation as well as seeing some of protagonists' work um, prior to this. So first, the property rights narratives outlined on page six are interesting and I think potentially a good starting point to help guide us as we dig deeper into each one and how it plays out in a given country or region um, uh, in which country is based. Additionally, um, the map on page eight shows quite neatly how very different these discussions are in different regions. The fact that you show the top narratives in East Africa as the importance of women's rights and of property rights as a human rights issue is an interesting data point for Wellspring in particular, given our focus on advancing women's land and property rights within a broader human rights frame. So what discussions, uh, what, sorry, what questions come up for me and what do I see as opportunities in terms of next steps? And I, I would say here that I share some of uh, Yulia's interests in terms of next steps. Um, so first, I'm struck that in your summary of narratives that there's no mention of corruption, um, such as government signing corrupt deals with oil or extractive companies or of local energy needs being balanced against other property rights um, needs or how corrupt African leaders have taken so much land for themselves, their families, um, cronies, et cetera, um, that it impacts entire nations in terms of land available for other private um, individual level ownership. Um, I'm not sure if your search terms didn't pull up those articles or if they are so localized in Africa that it didn't pop up into the top term since the volume of coverage about land issues in Africa is likely less compared to English language news sources elsewhere in the world. Um, so that's just a question that I have. 
Um, and then I would just add that while I think this is a really interesting first step, um, giving us kind of a macro view of what, um, what the language looks like out there in terms of property rights, um, I think the analysis would have to be conducted at the regional or country level to be more valuable in terms of helping advocates in particular that are working for change in their own countries. So some questions that come up for me are, how can this data be translated from uh, data to a tool that advocates can use in a local context? Um, to what extent can it be translated into messages that resonate for different stakeholders that really serve as the gatekeepers to advancing property rights in the countries in which OM and, uh, and other foundations are working in. Um, and finally, this project dovetails nicely with two projects that we're in the thick of um, at Wellspring Philanthropic Fund. Um, and that's a project in Kenya, which is looking um, to conduct research, test and develop messages on women's land and property rights specifically. Um, and also a second project on addressing negative social norms that hinder the realization of women's land and property rights um, in East Africa as well. And that's focused in Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania. Um, where there are, I would just say that there are, there's a presence of favorable laws that are seemingly in place to protect women's land and property rights, but that we're still not, we're seeing a huge gap there in terms of realization of those rights. Um, and then I would just add that although our project is in the early stages, we'll look forward to sharing our findings with this group as we start to see insights and lessons emerging um, in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maitri. Um, Emily, there were a number of questions there. I don't know if you want to walk through a few of your answers and, and then you're probably going to keep your slides up for that, but then if maybe at, when you're done, if you want to take the slides down or stop sharing that to you, but over to you. Sure, I can stop sharing now, actually. I think, um, so I was taking some notes. Uh, hopefully you can't see my screen now, right? Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, I was taking some notes. Thank you all for your uh, remarks, really. Um, it's always great for us um, to hear uh, from you who are all sort of the the subject matter experts. Um, I like to say that we're the narrative experts. So um, it's always good to sort of get that extra lens. Um, so I was taking some notes on your questions and comments. Um, so I'll just start to dive into those, but please um, shout if I miss something. So um, one thing, uh, Yulia, I heard you ask was, you know, how does this um, compare to the, the sort of other development um, topics um, and conversations? And we've actually done a lot of work with other foundations around um, a lot of social issues, everything from um, climate change, um, uh, early education, higher education. Um, and uh, we've actually looked at specifically the climate change uh, conversation and human rights conversation. Uh, as it compares to the property rights conversation to get a sense of how is property rights doing? Um, and I started to, to uh, talk about that towards the end of the presentation and the barometer. Um, so what we found with um, these sort of development conversations is there's, um, there's a lot out there. Uh, a lot of these conversations, especially now, uh, since we've started observing these conversations post uh, the Trump administration, uh, a lot of sensitivity to um, uh, policy events. So that's sort of one thing that is common throughout all of these conversations. Um, less so on the global uh, scale. Most of the, the work we do is just observing um, conversations in the United States. Um, but specifically for property rights, we found that um, the content doesn't have um, sort of this emotional and um, uh, resonance that some of these other uh, more sort of uh, uh, larger conversations around human rights and climate change have. So um, there's less resonance, there's less uh, social media sharing. Um, the, the content for property rights tends to be a little bit drier. Um, and we found that um, when property rights really does sort of get uh, in the spotlight, it's usually actually paired with another development issue. So um, this idea around gender, actually. So in the in the broader conversation, the uh, narrative that talks about women's rights and, and property rights, um, to your point, is it's actually pretty low when we looked at the impact scores. However, that actually gets the narrative uh, that gets the most coverage in the international sources, in the highest 
uh, sort of uh, readership publications. So that's an interesting economy uh, that we found is that um, when property rights is paired with um, a, another issue, there tends to be a little bit more momentum there. Um, so that's, uh, that's one thing I wanted to address. Um, Caitlin, you had a question around uh, what are the, the biggest things that help change a narrative over time? And, and um, so that's a big question. Um, so thinking about narratives and this idea that they're, they're sort of these structured stories that people use as mental models, um, it, it does take a while to sort of shift the conversation. But we do, we have found that um, uh, it, it is possible. And so what we, we try to do is, uh, depending on what the conversation is, um, the narratives that you have in the conversation are the narratives you have. And so um, you want to find different ways to either um, attach or amplify a narrative that is favorable to you uh, or your, your position. And you want to avoid triggering something that potentially is, is not favorable. So in this case, um, uh, something like squatting is a crime. Um, and so we actually work with, um, we do different analysis and work with other, some of our other clients to um, actually look at the specific language that people are using. Um, so one example is uh, we, we have a, a client working in the um, higher education space and they always talk about equity um, and realized in our observations of the conversation, no one actually says equity, they say fairness. And so we've helped them shift some of their outbound communications to use um, language that is already uh, resonating with their target audience. Um, so that way there's a, there's a better chance that they are going to connect with a broader audience. Um, and so what we do is we do um, text analysis, we do emotional sentiment analysis um, to help sort of um, uh, take the position that, that a uh, conversation and a customer has and um, sort of pivot it to, to sort of uh, launch for growth, if that makes sense. Um, another question that came up or a remark was around um, uh, regional and country level, how this can be uh, translated in a tool for advocates. I think that's a great question. Um, something that we do uh, beyond observing different uh, conversations, we also can observe how often a certain organization, um, a certain actor, a certain person is coming up. And so that can also help you understand who's influencing the conversation and how they're influencing it. Um, so uh, one thing we could do is uh, use that to understand um, uh, what are the sort of available uh, unique or trending characteristics of different people or organizations that really resonate with, with a broader audience. Um, so, you know, we, our, our capabilities right now are sort of limited to uh, English, English and Romance language uh, uh, with our technology. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I definitely think it is possible, um, assuming if we wanted to do this at a country level, we absolutely could, um, just sort of language dependent. But that would give us even a, a more specific, localized understanding of what uh, the conversation is in each country. And as we saw from the regional analysis, um, we know it would differ based on just how uh, colorful and diverse that map was. Great. Do you have more? I have, a, I have a few questions from the audience I wanted to throw at you too. Sure, yeah. So we have one question um, saying that it looked like land grabbing wasn't high on the agenda in West Africa and that the participant was surprised about that. And I guess that pairs with, the, with a question I was having, which is, is there any... Um, potential that this would be done with French soon too, or? Yeah, actually that has come up um, uh, in the last couple of weeks. It's not something that we've done yet, uh, but I do think it'd be, it'd be really great to explore. And, um, you know, uh, based on what we saw in the Spanish conversation, um, I'm assuming we'd see the same 10 narratives, but there'd be some significant differences um, in, in their ordering and sort of what rises to the top um, from that perspective. So. Um, not yet, but hopefully soon. Great, thanks. And then um, from Human Rights Watch, we had a couple questions there at the bottom of the list, if you can see them. Do the analytics identify categories of who is sharing? Any way to figure out how much government officials are engaging? And then the second question is whether the analytics looks at um, documentaries, multimedia, or only written articles? Yeah, great questions. Um, so, 
Uh, the analytics, we don't look at who is sharing. It's just uh, of a certain piece of content, how, what the sort of numbers are. Um, we have done analysis, though, looking specifically at conversations that policymakers are having. Um, so we're actually doing that in the financial inclusion space. Um, how uh, policymakers globally are thinking about financial inclusion, financial technology, and reg tech as well. So um, a little bit of a different spin, and that's actually a little bit more tailored. Um, uh, so we're, we're pulling in content that uh, those policymakers would read. Um, so that's, uh, we, we didn't do that for this analysis, but definitely something we're capable of. Um, the other question was, uh, does it look at documentaries, multimedia? Um, if there's a written transcript, yes, we will pull that into our data set. Um, so as long as the transcript is there, we've pulled it in radio uh, show content. Um, so that's, that's definitely feasible. Great. Um, I just want to, there were, I was going to, let me throw three at you from the, from the top of the list. Um, question about why you treated blogs as traditional media versus social media. Question about the sources of the narratives and can you tell who's driving them? And then the, um, the third one was why, why were we confining this work to just two years of data? Sure. So, um, the reason we treat blogs as, um, uh, its own category is um, because anyone can kind of set up shop and uh, uh, write whatever they want in their corner of the internet and then actually you have the ability to share that content via social media so um, in and of itself it's its own sort of uh, place um, so that's why we we consider it uh, not traditional media um, and not social media it's sort of its own uh, medium there um, the second question, uh, sources of the narratives and who's driving them. Um, yes, so we actually, um, this was actually a question we, we talked about a lot with Omidyar. Um, uh, there was some questions around how do we know that it's not just sort of these broader, uh, larger publications that are driving the content and we're not just capturing, you know, the New York Times, the BBC and the Guardian. Um, so our, um, our technology platform is source agnostic. And so we will pull in any content that has this uh, narrative content in it. So in the English conversation, it ranges everything, I think it was um, over 3000 sources that we pulled in. Um, so everything from uh, Reuters, um, the Times of India, uh, Uganda Daily Monitor, Al Jazeera, Huffington Post. So it really sort of runs the gamut of um, uh, local to, to large publications. And that just uh, contributes to the, the broader diversity of the sources. So um, we're less concerned about who is publishing the content initially and more concerned about what, is, what are they actually saying. Um, and then the last question you had was, uh, why are you confined to a year or two years? So um, what we found and the, the trend analysis slides sort of show this um, is that while the narratives don't change, um, they fluctuate in terms of their prominence and importance over time. And so you have something like the Dakota Access Pipeline really spike. Um, and so what we wanna do is normally we only try to capture the most recent years conversation to sort of get um, the latest and greatest. And sometimes we'll go back two years, but um, we found in order to sort of stay current, it, it's much better to capture what's happening now than take the sort of longer historical view. Great, thank you. And I want to encourage the panelists if they want to chime in too, the, the questions are coming in fast and furious. <laughs> um, so the, the, I had, the, but one question just caught my eye, uh, down at the bottom, Emily, if you're looking. Um, you mentioned in the English content, DAPL was 93%. And given that that is so disproportionate, was there a, was, was there a, a, a detailed analysis of that other 7% to sort of pull out the, the nuance there that was getting drowned out? Um, no, we didn't. I, I, I think it was more generalized content around um, these issues of land grabbing. It's not necessarily sort of just the the overall argument around, um, you know, uh, fairness and, and uh, understanding who's, uh, who has rights to that land. Um, the, uh, the, really, the point of that um, quick analysis we did was just to, to show the power of, of that one conversation. So we didn't really dive more deeply into that, converse, and into that um, subsequent content. 
Um, but it actually will be interesting when we pull uh, 2018 content. Um, we're expecting there to be a, a very different um, conversation in terms of uh, the impact score, how many, where, where each narrative um, uh, lands. And I imagine that land grabbing will sort of uh, be a lower impact narrative, but uh, time will tell. Okay. Okay. Um, again, just to just to try to get through some of these questions, and I want to encourage the audience. Please do keep the questions coming. These these are great. Um, at, at the bottom, there was um, a, two, a two parter. Do the analytics also identify ongoing research work at a national level? Same participant. How are the search terms generated, and what steps have been taken to overcome potential bias? Yeah. Um, so in terms of ongoing research at the national level, um, if there are, we definitely pull in different reports from different organizations, governments. Um, so if that is, uh, out on the internet, um, we, and, and particularly, uh, publish as, uh, part of some sort of news source, um, we will pull that in. Um, the, the question around, um, uh, how are the search terms generated and what steps have uh, how do we overcome bias? Um, so we have basically a Boolean search that we use uh, to query our, um, our in our technology platform. And so um, what we usually do is our analysts um, uh, do a little bit of research on the topic and then we meet with our customers to say, okay, um, we're going to put the parameters, you know, at here and here's sort of what we're seeing. Does that sort of resonate with you? Because again, we're not the experts here, you are, but does this sort of resonate with you? Um, and so we'll go back and forth and, and collabor collaborate with our customers to make sure that um, the topics make sense and the search terms and, and the content that we're seeing um, is, is, is relevant. Uh, from there, we have the, the technology actually do sort of the heavy lifting around what is considered narrative and non-narrative. Um, and then our analysts go in and um, look at the aggregated content they see and, and um, basically, it, it clusters in different ways, so you can see the distinct topics. Um, so, really, it's it's the technology that keeps the bias. Okay, um, thank you. Couple, uh, is this okay? Working just sending them to you in batches here. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so from the top of the list, uh, the question, the narrative of property rights aren't a silver bullet was interesting in Spanish. Can you expand on that? And then under that, there was a, a request from someone in the field, can we disaggregate, can we get a specific disaggregation for countries who may be working in, for example, in the Mekong region? Could we get, get just get do a deep dive? I think a double click is what I'm understanding this question to be on the countries there, like Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam, Myanmar, Thailand. Yeah, so we, um, we didn't do a deep dive on a country level. Um, we wanted to keep it sort of higher level, so I can't really speak to um, that specific region. Um, for property rights is, are, aren't a silver bullet, um, what we found uh, in, in the Spanish content was um, the, the volume was really driven by various reports on indigenous land rights um, and, and the battles that garnered, uh, that, that were sort of had there, but there wasn't much social engagement. Um, uh, the, there was discussions of pension reform, um, and uh, it really revealed that the, the position land rights uh, in a sort of broader, more complex social dynamic um, that includes discussion of economic reform and other policies. So um, uh, while there were many social policies related to property rights and discussed, no, no one sort of solution was, was dominating the discussion. Um, but as I mentioned in my opening comments, um, this narrative in Spanish was, was really driven by um, the farmers' protests and, and, and coverage of that um, whereas the, the English content was much more sort of um, uh, policy focused and trying to find solutions. So um, a little bit of a dichotomy there and it'd be, it will be interesting to see um, how that evolves in the Spanish context in the, in the upcoming year. Great. Um, sort of related, on the bottom of the question list, there was a question, the DAPL use asking really about the terminology I mean given that was such a phenomenon did they use land grabbing terminology or did they use other synonyms or terms in their social media strategy did that did that come out um so the coverage of the Dakota access pipeline um I don't know so land grabbing specifically I'm sure there was there was probably some content that that described it that way um, you know, our, our search terms are, um, are uh, 
usually, you know, 40 to 60 words long. So we really do want to capture sort of the depth and breadth of that. Um, so it, it's, it was probably in there, definitely not the, um, the predominant terms. Um, mm -hmm. What we do is once we find what the narrative is, our analysts um, have the ability to sort of name it and we try to keep the names succinct and sort of right to the point. So that was a little bit of the, the humanistic uh, view there. Right. Um, staying at the bottom for a second, can the barometer be used to compare the level of coverage of land rights relative to other issues in something resembling quantitative method? Yeah, so that's actually how we're tracking progress when, when we started this barometer. Um, initially, you know, we thought it'd be great to, to just see what the property rights conversation was doing um, and realized in Midiar, we had some great conversations around well, yes, that's important, but we need, you know, uh, something else to compare it to. Um, so while we are focused on the property rights conversation, we're actually doing it in tandem, um, not as an in-depth analysis, but um, using the climate change and human rights conversations as um, comparison points to better understand um, if, if property rights is doing better than it was last year, that's great, but is climate change doing even better? Um, so sort of, uh, Observation of other conversations is really essential for the barometer to, to have meaning. Got it. I, I, what, I mean, one thing I, this is my question. I mean, one thing I've gotten a lot of traction with talking about property rights, and this is building off of your point um, that it, it gets more traction when it's paired with another issue, is instead of talking about it specific just as a problem, because there are, there are major issues, but also using it in the context of, if, you, if your issue is, economic empowerment, if your issue is, is gender, if your issue is whatever, land rights is, is, is a powerful tool to help the community or, or if your issue is in the environment, you know, land rights, communal rights over the forest is a powerful tool for advocating that. And I'm just, that's always been one of my hypotheses. How would I prove that with this data? Well, I think we saw that um, in the, the gender narrative that was, um, you know, r rising to the top in the international um, publications. Um, one thing we do when we, we look at a narrative is understand uh, what's driving the narrative and what are the topics associated with that. So um, we have some narratives that are very much focused on um, environmental issues, some that are very focused on indigenous issues. Um, but what we, we want to portray in, a, in our work is that it's not just sort of one analysis that's going um, <laughs> to borrow a, a narrative title. It's not, it's not going to be a silver bullet. Um, it, you need to sort of see the, the whole complex, uh, how is this doing globally, how is this doing specifically in your region, um, uh, who are the actors that are driving this. Um, so we could definitely observe from the data um, how often specific um, topics are paired together, and that could give you an indication of if it's actually, um, actually connecting, and then is it actually resonating in the broader conversation. Great. Thank you. Um, and then one more question. Indigenous rights didn't emerge as much of a narrative in Spanish. It, it, it's sort of interesting given how prominent the topic is. So, so yeah. can you help us understand why that might be? Yeah. Um, so actually, um, indigenous rights came up a lot in Spanish. However, um, it, the framing of the rights were more of a domestic political issue um, and differed substantially from the English conversation. So. Um, uh, there was, uh, in English, sort of these global issues like um, climate change and post-apartheid reconciliation in South Africa that drove um, sort of all of this uh, content in, in the English discourse. Um, specifically, indigenous rights in Spanish were uh, more sort of central to um, uh, broader narratives in a way that sort of didn't pop in in its own, uh, in the English conversation as well. Got it, okay. Um, we're coming up on time. They were supposed to end in about 10 minutes. So I just wanna flag for the panelists, if you guys have any last thoughts, we, have, we are down to three last questions. Um, the first one on the list, Emily, if you go to the, those last three lines, um, there's, a lot, there's a bit of preamble there. Um, the question is, how can this data be translated into a tool that can help us to address these multifaceted issues? I think one of the panelists sort of asked that too, is how do we take this data and these insights and translate them into a drop down where you're like, I'm in this country, what are the burning issues? What are the, what are the flags? How, what, what would that look like? 
Yeah, so um, I think Caitlin touched on this a little bit around the communications that your your organization is um, is portraying. And so, um, what one thing that we want to do is uh, take you could do is take this analysis, sorry, and um, uh, look at okay, what are the narratives that are sort of um, most resonant in in your line of work in your region, and how are you positioning uh, your organization's work? So. Uh, is what you're actually promoting and advocating for aligned with what people are actually, what is actually resonating with people. So um, we've actually done analysis like this. So, um, uh, you know, organizations will say, we want to focus on this issue, but their, their communications actually focus on a different narrative. Um, so that's one sort of piece that, that from an analytics perspective can be done. Um, I think another thing is, um, if you're not sort of seeing the narrative pop that you want to, um, generating that content. So how do you engage um, as an organization uh, internally and also sort of your partners to push a certain uh, perspective? Um, and so what this is supposed to do is really just act as a catalyst. Um, this is what the media is saying. Um, and it's, it's you know, essentially um, a, a litmus test for what people are thinking. Um, so this should really sort of be uh, the start of a, of a larger conversation um, and really could help uh, future programming as, as, um, as you go forward. Great. Um, the top question on the list, how are certain methodological biases, e.g. E disproportionate number of media outlets in the North, alter data and therefore paint a different picture than what the data might be if we, if we um, looked qualitatively? How, how are you, yeah, to, I'll let you take that one. Yeah, so um, this is, I think, a little bit similar to an earlier question um, that uh, we, we don't only look at uh, uh, Western and uh, sources. Um, so I think in the English data set, we brought over 3,000. Um, so what we do is, is we rank the sources um, by readership um, to give them a little bit more weight. Um, but we're, we're very careful that um, we kind of want to observe what people are saying we call it in the in the wild. So when we're capturing content that's on the internet that is not um, uh, provoked by any sort of um, question, so people are freely going on it and writing this. So um, that's sort of how we we guard against bias there, and then also our, our technology platform as well. Great, thank you very much. So we're coming up on time. I want to pass it quickly over to the panelists in case they want to say say anything, and then uh, we'll wrap this up. Let's, let's go in reverse order. So Maitri, do you want to come in? Yeah, I just had one lingering question on the corruption uh, piece. Did that come up at all? Or can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I think we saw that um, uh, corruption is such a big topic. And so um, it actually came up as a topic in several narratives. Um, but this idea that um, narratives, they sort of have this, this called this certain structure. Um, so a lot of the content that we saw started with this idea that there is corruption or we need to end corruption, but the, um, the call to action was, was different. So we actually saw it come up in so many different ways. It wasn't its own narrative. It actually um, was a little bit more nuanced than that. Thank you. Great. Caitlin? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Emily, first and foremost, thanks. Uh, I know this uh, a lot to I think we're having the point you made here at the end about this being a catalyst. And kind of spot on. I feel like this is, oh, are we okay? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Wi-Fi might be spotty. Um, but um, yeah, I think it's it's important to keep in mind that this catalyst test in and of itself will not necessarily uh, write a communications plan for an organization, but I think it can be the start of a very important discussion on um, if an organization is communicating in the right way to reach its goals and its target audiences. So look forward to using it more. And um, yeah, excited to see where it goes from here. Yeah, it's definitely great fodder for any communications in-house people. Um, and then Yulia, if you want to, any last thoughts? 
Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, and thanks again to Emily for the great presentation. Uh, so for us, from Omidyar's perspective, we already know that this content is interesting, but our next question is, is it useful? And how is it useful? And who is it useful? Uh, so to that end, uh, we'd like to further engage with the broader land and property rights community on this topic and see if we can maybe even pull in a few uh, members of the community as either part of an advisory group or some other thought group that can kind of help inform and steer this ongoing analysis because we do plan to rerun it uh, on an annual basis as of now. So if uh, New America will indulge me, um, I know that we'll be sending out Caitlin's slides, or sorry, Emily's slides after the presentation. I'll also include my email address and uh, a short blurb. And if you're interested in uh, being part of such a thought group, I really would encourage you to get in touch. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leah. And thank you to the, thank you, Emily, for the great presentation and taking all those questions on the fly and to all of our panelists. And this, um, you will get an email about this. And then if you're having a colleague or somebody from your communications group that wasn't here and you want them to be, don't worry, we've reported the whole thing and it will be up um, on our New America website, newamerica.org backslash FPR. So um, look forward to, to sharing that. And thank you all for joining with that. We will end three minutes early. It's pretty good. Okay, thank you, everybody.